I spent the afternoon just praying and asking God what to, uh, what to speak on, and I never got a whole lot of clarity on what to speak about and all that stuff, so I'm just going to pray. And scripture came to me since I've been in here, so I might just read. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just going to read that, and I'm going to, uh, I do have a couple things that I've been on my mind, so you might get two quick sermons. I don't know, what, I don't know what's going to happen. Anyways, Father, I just thank you that we can come in here tonight and praise your name and worship you, God. I thank you that you are not ever stuck, Father. And because you're never stuck, I'm not going to be stuck. <laughs> and I believe and I trust you, Father, for the words to speak tonight, Lord. I trust you that you would use me to speak through me, Father, whether it's five minutes or 20 minutes, Lord. Whatever it is, Father, I just give you full and complete control. I thank you that, Holy Spirit, that you will use what happens in the next little bit, Father, for your glory, God, and that lives will be touched and hearts would be open to hear what you're saying, Father. And we just give you all the praise and glory because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I'm just going to read a scripture. I, uh, Like I said, I don't know. This is just probably one of my favorite. And you've probably heard me used this scripture many times before, and I'm probably going to use it many times again, but every time I read it, something else comes out to me, and there was something came out to me this evening when I, actually, since I came in here when I read it, so I just wanted to read this to you, and just for a minute, just exhort you, so it's in Ezekiel chapter 37, and a lot of you, as soon as I said that, he knows exactly where we're going, and it's, we're going to the Valley of Dry Bones, and and the prophet said, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. When I read that earlier, I kind of got stopped for a second and thought about my life. And how many times, and you, how many times we've been sat down in dryness. Come on, how many times have you been in your home and you've been in dryness? I'm just going to read this. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Then he caused me to pass by them around them, and behold, there were many, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, Oh Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put muscles on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I did as I was commanded. Amen. So I did as I was commanded. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone, Indeed, as I looked, the muscles and the flesh came up on them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, and these, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them. And they lived and stood up on their feet as an exceedingly great army. And as I was reading that, I read through the first verse and I, I started, I, I just kind of popped out at me. How many times have we been sitting in, in either in our home and it's been dry and there's been dryness all around? And how many times have we been in our workplaces and there's been dryness and there's been dry people all around? And, and you feel like you're just being drained by the, the everybody around? And how many times, hey, have you been in church is... And you felt the dryness and the dryness around. And I believe that the Spirit of God's asking us, and if I don't do anything other than read the scripture, I believe the Spirit of God's asking us to stop prophesying in our situations, in our houses, in our homes, in our churches, in our businesses, in our malls, everywhere we go, there's dryness, there's dry things going on, there's 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 places you go, and you know, I'm telling you, you go to some church services, and I'll tell you that. It's, it's, it's like, what is it they say, last year's bird nest. It's so dry. But I believe that God's, God's asking us, and he's asking us to start prophesying. And you know what? I liked when he said, 
God, you know. God asked him to prophesy. Instead of just prophesying, he did, God didn't say, he said, God, you know that these can live. You know that this can happen. You know, God, you know. He said, but then he commanded me. And I believe God's commanding us in these last days to start prophesying to our situations, start prophesying to our, our financial situations, Pro start prophesying to our minds, start prophesying to our bodies, start prophesying every day to situations that we are dealing with, that we feel that there's no hope and there's no way out and there's no, no thing, nothing that can then change it. God's saying prophesy it to it. Yes, it looks dry, it looks dead, it looks like there's no hope, there's no way that's going to fix itself, there's no way it's going to fix it. And you know what, in the natural, there's probably not no way that it's going to fix itself. But we need to start prophesying and start believing that the Spirit of God is going to bring life to our situation, life to our bodies, life to our family members. Life, listen, there's some of you got family members, there's some of you got sisters and brothers, you got moms and dads, uncles and aunts, you got people that are not in the kingdom and they're so dry and they're so, you feel like there's no way. God's saying prophesy what you want to see in their lives. Prophesy breath into their bodies, the spirit of God into their lives. And I'm telling you, you will see it in this last days. Because I believe God's getting ready to ramp up some great and mighty things in this last days. And I believe signs and wonders, like I said this morning, shall follow them that believe. And if you believe and you can prophesy, I believe that, I believe that we're going to see some great and mighty things. I, I wrote down a couple of things and I was thinking about some stuff and I just wanted to talk about that. But then I, when I seen the scripture, so I might just go back to this for a minute. But I was thinking about down to the wire. How many times we've been in situations where we really needed God to come through for us and where we had to believe and we had to see God do things for us that have uh, been down to the last straw, I guess we would say, or down to where it was, hey, God, we need you to intervene right now. And I was brought back to the, 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 the widow woman that buried her husband and she was going through a famine for a famine that actually the prophet commanded to happen. And uh, she was... She was getting ready to die. She was, she was getting ready to, to um, cook her last meal for her and her son so that they can die before they would, because there was no food. And the prophet that spoke and commanded the drought to happen was sat down by the brook and he was being fed and there was water he was drinking, but he drank the brook dry. And God spoke to him and said, go to the town. I prepared a woman for you that will feed you. And uh, he went to the town, and you know the story. She, she was, like I said, just getting ready to cook her last meal and getting ready to die. But yet God was preparing her to be the That was the woman that he had prepared to feed him. But see, that's how God works. We don't understand that. You think that God would have sent her to someone that had already stored up a bunch of stuff. That's what I would have thought. Okay, God, I'm looking for someone that got a lot of food in their storehouses and that if they've stored up because of this drought and someone that was prepared for this. God, why, why are you showing me the woman with, with, with just one meal left? And God said, that's her. <laughs> all right, all right. So he went to her and he said to her, he said, uh, he said, uh, what do you got left? And she said, I got enough to feed me and my son. I'm going to make a cake and then we're going to die. And he said, well, no, make me one first. Now, I don't know about you. And I don't know about what I would think. But I'm thinking that if, if I was on my last meal and my kids were there and I was just going to feed them before I were to die and a prophet came in, I'm believing that I would have said, amen, okay, I'll make you the cake and I'm going to believe God. But sh most people today would say, no, sir, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I just got enough to feed us. But she went in, and she made the cake just as the prophet commanded. And she made it, and she, he ate the cake, and he said, now go make one for you and your son. And she kind of looked at him and said, but that was it. So she went back to the bar barrel, and there was, there was enough food there, oil there, I think it is, to make it for her and her son. And the story doesn't end there. She didn't die after she made that last one. It kept coming back. 
And somebody says, well, why didn't he fill the barrel up uh, so that it was there? And he said that uh, God didn't want to make it go stale. So every day that she went back, I think it was a thousand days longer that she kept getting fed until the famine was over. And I'm telling you, that's what God's looking for some people that are down to the wire. And you don't know what you're going to do next. Listen and be obedient to what God's asking you to do. And uh, I believe, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were asked to bow and worship a God other than the one that they were, they, they, one that they worshiped freely. And they weren't allowed to worship him. They were asked to bow to the God of Baal. And they said, not a chance. And he said, if you don't bow, we're going to throw you into fire. You know this story. This is not old stories. I just want to bring it up to you. What were they going to do? Were they going to throw him into fire? Most of us would probably say, well, well, we'll bow down. We won't say a whole lot of stuff, but we'll just bow down because, you know what, we, we don't want to stand out because if we stand out, we might get ridiculed and we might get hurt and we're going to get through in the fire, so we'll just bow down. We won't say nothing. No, they stood and they said, no, we, we serve only one God, and, and they, that's not him, and we ain't going to bow to him. So they threw him in the fire, but I believe that as soon as they said that we wouldn't bow, I believe Jesus said, oh, i got to go down and wait for them. I'm going to go get in the fire now and wait because they're coming. They're going to go in. And as I was reading that a little while ago, not today, but I was reading it a little while ago, I was thinking, isn't it funny how they had to go in the fire, but Jesus was already there. Come on, some of you are going to go through the fire, but he's already there. Amen? Some of you are going to go through some struggles and some trials because he said that this world's going to be full of it. And you're going to deal with a lot of it. But he said, be of good cheer. I'll be there to take you through it. Amen? That's God saying, that's right. So, so you just got to keep believing that this, and you know what? You might be down to the last hour, and you might even have to go and meet the fire, but God's going to be there for you. When Peter was in jail, think about that. I was thinking about that story this afternoon, or this evening, actually, just before I came here. Peter was in jail, and the King Herod was ready to come in that night to kill him. That hour, that night, he was coming in, and you know what? The angel came in to the cell just before King Herod sent his men. But guess what Peter was doing? He was doing something that none of you guys would have been doing. He was sleeping. He was sleeping. You know what? Sometimes when we're in some struggles and some trials and some, tempt, some, some, just, some things that are pushed down and we don't know what's going to happen, just go to sleep. Just go to sleep and trust God. Amen? Come on, how many times like, I can tell you of stories of, of the way God have come through for us and through for my family and through for just so many times. And, and I'm telling you, I've never, ever seen my father pull his hair out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had, yeah, I've come close. Uh, but I've never seen him stressed out and wondering what, what's going to happen next and what we're going to do next. But he slid his head down and he slept. And I believe that when the angel came in, they said the angel had to poke him and wake him up. And he had to actually open his eyes and he didn't even know who it was because he was so sound sleeping. Hey, he's getting killed in a few minutes. They're going to kill him in a minute. Hmm. Come on. Where would you be? You'd be over in the corner shaking and shivering, saying, oh, dear God, why, why, why did you leave me? Why did you let me get down here? Why in the world did you put me through? Why am I in here? Why am I in here? God, I thought you loved me. Come on. That's the church of the day. Come on, God, we're not supposed to go through anything. Why, why don't you? I thought you loved me. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. Instead, you should be, you know what? It doesn't matter if they give you three weeks to live or 72 hours. In the 72 hours you got left, use your breath to say, thank you, Father, that you're my healer. And I've heard our pastor say so many times, well, I'd rather go in the, the gates of heaven saying, Father, you're my healer. You're my provider. You're everything that I need instead of walking in saying, God, I don't know why you didn't heal me. Hey, when you walk through the gates, he's going to explain if, the, if you didn't get healed on this side, okay? But I believe that he's our healer if we can trust and believe him. I can give you stories right through the Bible of many times where God came through just in the nick of time. Sometimes everybody thought it was too late. Come on, you know the story. It was three days too late, they thought. And he stinks. 
God, you missed it. Jesus, you missed it. If you'd been here, he'd still be alive. But it's never too late. Amen? Amen. I, I was just telling you about Paul or Peter in jail, and I started thinking about the story I told a little while ago, and I don't remember if, I, if you guys remember the story. And I, if, you, if you were here, that's good. And if you weren't here, i got to tell it again because it was a good story. And R.W. Schambach, and a lot of you have heard of him. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. And I watched the testimony from a little while ago, and, and it was, I sent it to our pastors, and it was pretty crazy. But um, he was telling about a story about he was in a service one night, and he was just preaching, and he was about 10 minutes into his message, and there was a, a young lady, and, and actually an older lady, just started coming up through the aisle. He says, right up through the aisle, and she just had her hand up in the air like this, and he was like, oh, boy, what's going on now? And she said, excuse me, excuse me, brother, excuse me, brother, brother Shambach. And he, 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 uh, he said, what is it, ma'am? And she said, I've never done this before in the service. And he said, well, I'm always the first for a lot of stuff. So he said, what is it? And she said, well, she said, my son, she said, I love him dearly. She said, but tonight it's 930, she said, and in a half an hour he's supposed to be executed for committing a crime. For, for murder. And she said, I don't know if you know what a mom is to a son, but she said, a mom can tell when a son is lying and when he's not. And she said, I know that my son did not do this. And she said, in less than 30 minutes, they're going, they're going to put him into an execution chair and, and take his life. And he sat, stopped for a minute and he looked at her and he said, he said, I, 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 I knew when I looked at this woman that she knew that her son was innocent. And he said, I knew that, he said, when, when a woman can tell when, when her son is lying or when her child is lying or not. And he said, I knew, he, she knew her son was innocent. And I felt in my spirit, she said, he said that he was innocent. So I, I said to her, we're going to stop preaching right now and we're going to start praying. And he got everybody to start praying and he said, I didn't know what to pray. He said, you think about the situation, 30 minutes. This was 930, so now it's close to probably 9.35, and she's getting ready to, she's getting ready to, he's getting ready to be executed. It's 9.35, and he's praying, so he started off, and he said, when you don't know what to pray in English, he said, that's why the Holy Spirit gives us the, the gift of tongues. He said, start going in tongues, and he said, start interceding in the Spirit, and that's what he did, and he said, I started praying in the Spirit, he said, for a few minutes, and he said, and he said, it wasn't long before, he said, I started praying in English to her and prophesying, he said, and he said, listen, I was saying stuff that I wanted to kick myself for saying. I was saying, God, what in the world am I saying? But he said, I told the lady, your son will not die. You go home and go to bed, and he will be alive tomorrow. And he said, in the name of Jesus, sick him, Holy Spirit, wherever he is right now, you sick him, and you make him confess in the name of Jesus. And he said, woman, you go home and you go to bed, and your son will not die tonight. And he said, while I was saying it, he said, I was kicking myself because he said I was a bit... I was like, what in the world am I saying? I don't know if you guys have heard the story before, but I, I, I feel to share it again. Anyways, they went on with the service, went home. Actually, he went to his hotel because he was some, doing some meetings in, in New York. And he said he went, when he come down in the morning for breakfast, he always grabbed the paper out. And he said it was a nickel back then. And he put the nickel in to grab the paper. And he said as soon as he lifted up the paper, this was 9 o'clock in the morning, he said the, the, uh, the, the, a headline that caught his attention and that made him do a little Pentecost two-step on the, on, the, on the sidewalk, he said, was a, was a headline that said, man, uh, execution, uh, stay of execution. Uh, basically, I, I can't remember the headline, what he said it was, but he said something about man supposed to die, uh, execution has stayed. So basically, man, it didn't happen. He said, see more on page three. He said, I couldn't even go sit down in the restaurant. He said, I sat right there on the sidewalk and read it. And he said, he said, the, the, the officer that was getting ready to do it, it, the paper stated exactly what happened at 940. The officer said at 940 last night, come on, it was exactly when he said, sick him, Holy Spirit. 940, for some reason, a man called into the, to the station and said, hey, you're about to execute a man that never killed the man that you that you found in that in that hotel in that hotel room or in that floor on second floor. He said, 
He said, the, and, and, and the officer said, what are you saying, sir? He said, that man that you said that was, 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 was you're getting ready to execute, he said, that is not the man that killed this man. He said, he said, this man, and he explained and described exactly what the man was like and what happened and how it happened and all only details that the officer would have known. And he said, why are you doing this? He said, he said, I didn't, he said, I don't know why I'm doing this. He said, for some reason, I just called you. And he said, I can't help but confess. He said, I don't know, something grabbed a hold of me. And he said, I feel like I had to confess. And he said, well, where are you? He said, I'm on my way into a precinct right now. And he told him which precinct. And he went in and confessed. And, he, and, and the man was set free for a crime that he did not commit. 30 minutes, come on. 30 minutes. Most moms today, and this was a few years back, but most moms today would probably be home crying and saying, God, Oh, I can't believe you did this to my son. I can't believe you let my son. But she had faith, and she said, you know what? Even though there's only 30 minutes left, I'm going to go to somebody that believes. Amen? Uh, just another story before I finish. I tell a lot of stories from Shambach because I listened to him a nice bit, and he was telling a story about you ever see prayer cloths, and we've done this, and We've had situations and stuff. We've had prayer cloths that we've anointed and we prayed over and, and we've laid in people's, you know, brought and given to people and they brought it home for healings and stuff. I know my parents, I remember back when I was not the best boy that my parents anointed my hat that I always wore and when I put it on. So anyways, he was in a service one night and this lady came up and she said, I want you to anoint these candy. I want you to preach the rest of your message with these candy in your pocket. I know you guys are thinking, what in the world are you saying? Just listen to me for a minute. And she said, what? he said, what are you saying, woman? She said, I want you to take these candies. I want you to put them in your pocket while you preach this message tonight. And he said, woman, he said, listen, if you got an anchor chief, she, he said, what's going on? She said, well, my, my sister, she says, been in the, in the sane asylum for the last 30 years, and she is considered insane, and they will not let her out. And she is, she is, she is um, they said a bunch of things she had for the last 30 years, and he said she's not responded ever to anyone. She is in a mental state that is not, you can't even talk to her. He said, she, she said she's so bad. She said, I'm believing that God's going to, to heal her. She said, I want you to pr pray over them. I want you to Put them candy in your pocket and preach. And he said, woman, he said, you're crazy. And she said, oh, well. She said, I'm asking you. This is what I feel the Spirit of God lead me to do. And he said, how about I do a prayer of an anxious shift? She said, no, I've tried that, and they won't let that in. They know, they see where it's from. If she said, I've tried it with Kenneth Hagin, and she said, uh, Oral Roberts, and she said, they won't let those handkerchiefs get to her. She said, but Candy, he said, they'd never believe that. And she said, he said, woman, if I do that, he said, people are going to, he said, people will call me mud. And she said, well, mud, would you do what I said, please? <laughs> So he said, he said, I've seen the, 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 the sincerity and the, 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 the not taking no for an answer in that woman. So he said, I did what she, did. she asked me to do. I said, I put those candy in me. He said, I preached up a storm. He said, and then after the service, she come and took them. He said, it was six weeks later. He said, I was preaching and sitting in that same town. And he said, in walks this woman, he said, with another lady. And he says, do I, know? and he says, as soon as I looked, I remembered her face. And he said, hey, how are you? And she said, I want to testify. And he said, okay. He said, he, she said, meet my sister. She said, he said, she was here for 30 years. He said, but I, she said, I got those candy into him. He said, she said, and when I, she started eating those candies, he said, all of a sudden her mind started coming around. He said, and she started thinking straight. He said, and they started doing tests on her and saying, I don't know what's going on. But she said, there's something different. And they'd done all the tests they could figure out and trying to figure out why she was normal now. And they didn't want to let her out because she was normal. But they had no choice but to let her out. Come on. That's the God I serve. That's the God I serve. I believe God can help in any situation. I can tell you story after story after story. And I'd like to just tell you one more story. And I know you're, this is a story of my life. Years back. I, me, and, me and Lori were married, and we were wanting to buy a home. And uh, we didn't have the credit, nor did we have the money, nor did we have the down payment to do either. But we were believing for a home, and we were speaking it. So 
we had to have somewhere to live, so we decided to go look at a house. And when we looked at the house, we called the guy because he was living, moved to St. John's and it was his house. And he said, ah, oh, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I wish I had, if you'd been there an hour earlier, he said, there was the people before you just called and confirmed it. He said, and I said, well, I understand. I said, but if I give you my number, I said, anything changes, can you call me? And he said, not a problem, I'll do that. I got off the phone and I said, Lori, I said, they, 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 they uh, rented it to somebody, other people. And she said, okay, that's okay. She said, we'll, we'll believe God. And I said, that's right. So we did. And it was a couple hours later. He called back and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this. He said, but I just called the people that I told they can have it. He said, I, I need to give it to you. He said, it's yours if you want it. And I said, well, I want it. And uh, so we moved in there and we were there for a while. And uh, everything was fine. And the enemy tried to get us to move out for some stuff. There was people renting downstairs were causing some trouble. But we wouldn't move out. And we... we addressed them nicely and there was a couple times that I could have been not so nice but I was being led by the spirit of God I guess and I was very nice to them and now uh, he got evicted because of what he was doing and it wasn't crazy but you know what I kept a good relationship even though it was bad at the time and even today I see him now and we're really I'm good I'm not really good friends but I know him well and he's bought a vehicle off me I've you know it was a hard situation, but I didn't move, and I stayed there, and one day I got a call, and he said, hey, Matt, how's the things going? I said, they're going great. I said, you know, just thanks for everything, whatever, and he said, I got something to run by you, and I said, okay. Um, he said, I'm wondering if you're interested in uh, buying our house, and I said, well, I would love to. I said, but the cards are not in favor for me right now to do that. I said, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to get the mortgage. I said, I don't have a down payment. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I want you to assume my mortgage. And I said, I don't know anything about that. I said, but I'll check into it. And I said, I'll go to the bank. And, and I said, what, how much do you owe on it? He said, I said, like, how much do you want to buy? He said, no, 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 I don't want anything. He said, I just want you to assume my mortgage, take it for what, it's, what I owe on it. And he said, the house is yours, the rental is yours. He said, the house is yours. And I said, I'll check into it. But I said, I don't know anything about it. I said, but... Uh, Hey, I'll go to the bank. I'll do whatever I got to do to see. So I went to the bank, and I uh, went to the lady, and she said, I said, can you explain to me what you do to assume a mortgage? And she said, you get lawyers involved, and she said, you just sign over names. I think it's changed since then. But she said, uh, I had to do no application. I had to have no down payment, and I took the house for a lot less than what it was worth, and I I just walked into the house and took it over. Well, I was already in the house, but I took it over. My house, rent downstairs was coming in for me. People talked to him and said, you know, you're crazy. Why in the world would you have done that? You could have made money on that house. You could have done this. You could have done that. Why are you doing that? And he said, I have no idea why I did it. He said, but just some reason I felt to do it. He said, I can't explain it. I'm sorry. And these people came to my house, actually, the, the people that sold it to me. Uh, gave it to me, and uh, I had a good chat with them, and they said, uh, I got a chance to, to, me and Lori, we prayed blessings over them big time as soon as it happened. Anyways, um, I'm trying to make this long story short. Um, we, 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 I said to him when I was on the phone, I said, I said, I don't know what you believe, or he said, well, I said, I'm a Salvation Army, I am a Christian, and I said, well, good. I said, can I say something? I said, we're going to be praying for the blessing of God in your lives. And he said, well, I'll, I'll receive that. And I said, I want to thank you. I said, me and, me and Lori are, are, are super excited about what you've done for us. I don't know why you would do this. He said, you know, he said, if I had a, he said, if I had a dollar for everyone that told me how crazy it was, he said, I'd probably buy another house now. He said, but I don't know why I did it, but he said, I just did it. He said, and just whatever, he said, be blessed. And I said, okay. So anyways, um, I spoke to him about a couple years later, and he came to my house, actually, and we were chatting for a bit, and he said he was in St. John's, and he were, was in a house at the time, and they were looking at another house, and he said, I would love to have that house. And he said, but that house is way too expensive. And he said, and if we sold this one, he said, we'd have to get a mortgage almost double what. He said, it just would never work. He said, and he said, honestly, he said, after I looked at that house, he said, a week later, somebody come and knocked on my door and said, we want to buy your house. And he said, oh, well, I didn't have it for sale. And they said, well, can we make an offer? And they made an offer for the house that he was in that was enough to pay for the house that he was looking at. <clears throat> Come on. That's how my God works. 
That's how my God works. I prayed blessings of God on him. So he said, I, I, I don't know. He said, I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, I could believe it because I, I said, I believe that God's just blessing you for blessing me. And he said, I never thought about it this way. And I said, well, I said, that's what I believe. And I said, you know what? May the, I said, that, he said, I, I was stood there staring at the man when he made the offer. And he said, my wife almost fell down. He said, because we were so shocked at what happened. The exact amount that they needed for the house that they said they could never afford is what they offered for the house that they were living in at the time. That's the kind of God that I serve. Amen? Come on. So if you're into a situation, if you're into a place where you feel that there's no way out, if you feel that you don't know, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, I don't know how I'm going to make it, whether it's the doctor has told you that, hey, you know what? You're going to live with this the rest of your life. If the bank says, you know what, you're close. I don't know how you're ever going to make it out. You'll never be able to do this. You'll never be able to do that. Whether you're, the, the doctor said, you know what, your mind is a mess and you're never going to get out of this and you're, you're going to have to deal with this in your mind for the rest of your life. I believe in a God that can set free. I believe in a God that can heal. I believe in a God that can financially provide for anybody I believe that he, you know what and it doesn't matter how late it is into the situation you're in if you're into the brink of, of bankruptcy if you're into the brink of death if you're into the brink of your mind losing it all together I believe that God can snap you out and you can be stronger and better and, and more prosperous and healthier than you've ever been before but you need to believe that as well amen 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 we just got to start prophesying to our situations. Come on, it might not happen the day after you prophesy, but don't take it back. Don't take it back. Don't take it back. I said, don't take it back. Come on, you prophesy and you speak it, and don't you ever change your words. And if everybody comes in and says, how's it going, young man? How's it going, young woman? Oh, you, uh, you must be going through some hard times. Say, I'm going through a hard time, but I'm still believing God. I've still spoken. I've still prophesied. And I'm still believing that what he said shall come to pass. And he said he will keep that which you've committed unto him until the day. Come on. Come on. Come on. We give up too easy. We give in too easy. And we listen to too many doubters and too many unbelievers too easy. Because we've seen it happen so many times. Come on. We, 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 you know what we are? We're popcorn Christians. We want to put it in the microwave and... Come on, less than three minutes, we want it done. But if you want it done, I've said this before, if you want it to come out smelling good and nice, you got sometimes you got to take the ingredients and put it together, put your faith and put the word into it and start interceding and start praying and start believing and mix it all together and put it in the oven and let God make you something that you will take out and you will sit down and you will feast on and it will be delicious. Amen? Come on. Throw it in the microwave and you're going to get, yes, it'll be cooked. But it'll probably be overcooked and it'll probably be rubbery and you probably won't enjoy it. But when you take your time and you do it right and you mix it right and you put it in the oven, come on. When you get it done and you sit down at the table that he has prepared for you in the midst of your enemies, in the midst of all those unbelievers, and you sit down and you eat at that table. You do it with a smile knowing that God goes before you and he is with you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to knock that water over. Amen. I'm going to get the musicians to come on up. I just want you to be encouraged. Don't give up. Don't doubt what God can do. Come on, if you doubt what he can do, get around some people that believes what he can do. If you're starting to get under this doubting thought and this mind that's saying, you know what, no, I don't know, I don't know, then you need to find some people that say, yes, 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 God can do it, God can do it, God can do it. Amen? Amen. I just, I'm going to get real for you for a minute. I just took on a new position. I just left my current position, job, and I took on a management position at another place. 
And I've never had the enemy scream and bawl and yell and tell me how crazy I was and how dumb I was and being real right now. I've been woken up and the enemy has screamed, you're crazy. He thinks I'm drinking, but I'm really just trying to get it together. And I started to listen yesterday. Started to get a little bit stressed yesterday. And I thought maybe I should go over and visit Dad. But it was my day off and I really wanted to spend with Lori and them, so I got up and Lori said, you should do you should go over and visit your dad so I got ready and went over and sat down and dad don't take usually long to catch on that there's something going on in your mind and he said so how's it going kind of opened the door for me and I give him a little brief of what I was dealing with <laughs> excuse me And I got around a believer. Two of them, actually. Mom was there. And they encouraged me and let me realize that, you know what? When God promotes, the enemy gets a little concerned and a little, little, little upset and a little mad. And he'll start throwing these suggestions. And then, the, you know, the familiar spirits come in and they try to, to attack your mind. And, and they know that it's the gateway. And I knew all that. And I know all that. But it was good to get around some believers. And I, and just to encourage me. And I just want to encourage you. That if you're dealing with some stuff. Don't stay in your bed. Or in your basement. Or in your house. And wallow and wail in it and get down on yourself and not get into the word and not start praying. You need to do that and then you need to find some believers that will stand with you and believe with you and encourage you. Come on, get yourself into a church that believes. You need to. You need to because we're, we're in a flesh that wants to be destroyed. Dealing with a mind that loves to overthinking to listen to lies sometimes but I just want you to be praying for me though that God will be with me and I know he is but I, the more people to pray for me the better and I'll pray for you but I just would like to say if just before we get ready to leave if any of you are in a situation that you feel like, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this situation. The doctor have said this. The bank have told me this. My psychiatrists have told me this. My family have said this to me. My mind is saying this to me and screaming at me any of you are dealing with anything like that there's some believers in this house that would love to stand around you and pray over you and encourage you and just speak blessings of God and just to anoint you and just to let you know that hey God is still for you God has not changed his mind on you he still loves you amen so while we sing this song if any of you are in any kind of situation like that that you're dealing with and you feel like you're past the, 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 the place where, you know what, I can deal with this my own self. Or I, I, I think I can fix this myself. You're into the place where, you know what, I don't know, God, I, I need your help. I really do. I, I really can't fix this because, you know, honestly, you can't fix much on your own. 
But with God, all things are possible. Amen? So while we sing this, if you want prayer, if you want some people to stand and believe with you tonight, we're not going to grab you and haul you to this altar. That's not what we do here. But we encourage you that, you know what, this is a place where you can come and there's some people that love you and there's a family that will stand around you and we will pray with you and we will believe God with you. So we're going to just sing this song, and as we do, you guys can stand with us. And if you want to come and we pray with you and we believe with you, then you feel free to come on up here, and there will be some people that will believe with you, and they will love on you. Amen.